Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Life podcast. On today's show, I have Darren Michael Boyd. Yeah, another musician. I love to interview musicians. It's, <laughs> love art. So it's one of my favorite types of art is live music. So we're going to get into that in a second. But if you're listening to podcasts a lot, you know what? I know that most of you that listen to podcasts really want to start a podcast or really want to try it out. And so the best way to do that is to save up a little bit of money and not worry about production and post editing and putting it on the internet and getting it to YouTube and doing all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you can do it all yourself, but then it becomes more of a hobby and it becomes like a job. So what I would say is go to getagripstudios.com where I'm sitting right now. We're fully virtual. In fact, my guest right now is not in Toronto. Maybe he's in Toronto, but he ain't in the studio here. He's over the internet. And so we can actually have two guests over the internet, fully um, digital studio, virtual studio. So check it out, getagripstudios.com. What's up, Darren? Hey, how are you doing? Doing well, yourself? It's bright, bright and early. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. don't know if that was my idea or not. It's a, for a musician. It's it's early. Yeah, you know what? I'm an early <laughs> riser, but you know, I did a musician yesterday <laughs> at 11:30, and he said it was early too. So I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I'm still up and running way earlier than that. Yeah, no matter what, even if it's a, you know, 4 a.m bedtime i'm still getting up you know by 10 anyway it's too many things to do <laughs> i hear you so what what yeah. me, first of all let's let's break it down um who like you you have a ton of different bands that you worked on what is it that you do every day with music right now what is it that you're doing are you in a band are you producing music what exactly are you doing well currently um i'm working on my next solo instrumental cd so that that was my latest project is the one lifting the uh, curse. Lifting the curse, yeah. yeah. So that's that's my latest one. Um, in fact, it's my first instrumental one. That that's the first time I've done that. No lyrics, and it seems to be going pretty well. No, no lyrics, and that was a little bit out of. Um, I don't. I don't want to say my comfort zone. I don't know what the word is. It's a little bit different for me because I've always been a, a lyricist and I've always been a songwriter. And so it was, it was freeing, but it was also a challenge. Let, let me, well, let me ask you something with your music. Are you trying to pass along, uh, a, like a deeper message through your music? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, to answer that, I mean, because it's not totally self-indulgent, right? It's not just about me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet when I was recording it, it was kind of therapeutic and it was, uh, I was still thinking the same thing that I'm not going to be the only one listening to this. And so um, I approached it. I mean, if you listen to the songs, many of them, you can really tell verse, chorus, all that, even though there are no words there, you, it, they're still structured like mm -hmm. regular songs. So there's, there's no nine minute free form <laughs> sure. songs that, that go everywhere. Um, but yeah, I, I think in the whole, I often say this CD is like a concept album, even though there are no lyrics, but you can mm -hmm. still kind of tell it, it, it has a, a mood and a, a feeling to it. Um, well, you know, it says in your bio here that um, it was um, therapeutic to make this album. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, it was, I don't know if it even says that in there, but I had a car accident um, and yeah, it, it was somebody ran a red light and, into me and yeah we, we often think you know because we have insurance you know people just if i had a dollar for every time i heard somebody say oh i hope somebody runs into my car so i can get a new car or something oh, and it's, yeah, sure. it's, that is not the process trust me um you don't want to get injured in a car accident uh and so despite the fact that it wasn't my fault uh obviously i can't get like into too many details like to avoid any sort of sure, legality of uh, issues. But we're more but, interested in the therapy side and the music side of it, right? Well, sure, sure. Just, just I guess, to, to wrap up that was that I was knocked out of commission for a few years. I couldn't really do the, the hard rock shows that I was doing before, mm. at least not in the same level or the same volume of shows. Um, so a couple of the bands I was working with, uh, three or four bands at the time, and that all just kind of went on hiatus for a while. And so everybody starts doing other other things, of course. And, you know, as a result, I, I still needed a creative outlet. So I was writing songs, as always. Um, and a lot of this stuff didn't seem to fit anywhere anyway. It didn't seem to fit, like, with uh, Creeping Beauty or, or 
famous underground from Toronto. They, they mm-hmm. weren't really those types of songs. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was therapeutic because it made me feel like, um, I, I was doing something that was still productive, mm-hmm. you know, in such a frustrating time and, and music is such a great healer and it's a great communication tool. Um, and, and I think people underestimate the value of music and I don't mean that monetarily. Uh, I mean, that's a whole different thing, but I mean, just in terms of how much it can help people and how much it, of an impact it has on our daily lives. We don't even realize, um, you know, I think everyone's life has a soundtrack, Darren. Yeah, yeah. And it tells us how to dress, you know, like we, sure. we, how we have our hair, our clothes, or the way we talk. I mean, all, all of that. So you I'm don't have to convince me. Everybody. You don't have yeah. to convince me of the. No, no, you don't have yeah. to convince me because yeah. I've actually thought a lot about music because I, I don't know how many mm-hmm. people I've, um, <clears throat> I've interviewed since uh, musicians in that. And, you know, I've thought a lot about um, why rock and roll seems to be in decline, for example. I've thought a lot about why, mm. um, you know, why mumble rap has really surged, right? And, mm. I, I, you know, what? I, I don't buy into the snobby side of the, the aging rocker that blames the audience. I no, think no, that, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I kind of yeah, say, yeah. you know, the, the audience is not the problem. You, you know, you, the, you need to create music that people want to listen to. And they, yeah. should, they, they shouldn't even have a choice. It should just capture them and get them, you know, get them excited. I mean, you remember, I don't know, I'm 42, so I remember when Appetite for Destruction came out. That was the first oh, album yeah, yeah. that I remember when I was a kid, yeah. someone handing me a tape of, and I stuck it in my tape player, and I went, wow, right oh, off yeah, the bat, yeah. and listened to the whole thing, and flipped it, you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. I, I was grabbed by that, and um, right away, from the very beginning, the opening song, uh, um, uh, Welcome to the Jungle. So, yeah. you know, I don't buy into that. Um, you know, so I think a lot about music and its meaning, and I think it tells you a lot about where people are at and what's popular. What, what's popular in music is shows you a lot about where a society's subconscious is at, what people yeah, are thinking. Yeah, it's a reflection about. or yes. a mirror to, yeah. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right because when, when Nirvana came and, and changed the scene, um, it, it, you know, people try to analyze that all the time and they blame it on this or that or whatever. But, it, it was a necessary change. People were, it, the whole 80s, um, you know, over over the top production, you know, how fast can you play the guitar? How big can your hair be? And how much, you know, all that kind of. It, yeah, it, sp- it, it was, was spent. It was spent. It, it was exhausted. Yeah, it, yeah, it was done. And, and, you know, people miss that. A lot of people do. But it, it was an absolute necessary change i think at least in the mainstream i, mean, I, I think people um, underestimate the the um the impact of the 89 stock market crash i mm. um on and the subsequent four-year recession that that came yeah. about and i don't right. think you know i don't think people with i mean as much as the 80s glam rock guys um uh claim to be rebellious or had a claim to like a Jimmy Dean kind of I'm out there I'm I'm bad kind of thing yeah. going. They were very much conforming to the climate of the times. In that yeah. it everything is so good that I can act this crazy and I still have my job at the factory on on the weekend I can go play guitar on the weekend and pretend I'm a rebel. Um and my hero is Iron Maiden or whatever and I think when people started to lose their jobs and the economy really tanked, I think that's when the when when the you know Kurt Cobain basically took over. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right for sure. Yeah, um, and, and it's true. Those '80s um, glam bands, a lot of them. I mean, there was so much excess that was being um, almost condoned, or, or you know, but, but yeah, it was, it was the '80s, man. It was, the 80s. Yeah, it was the '80s. It was the '80s. It was all. The, they all had record deals. They all had, you know, p- people were making their clothes, and get, you know, it was. There was a lot of good in it, but of course, it was fun. Yeah, it, it stopped being authentic after a while, and when it started, I think it was very authentic and very organic, and it was ever it was a whole lot of um, you know real enthusiasm. People were really loving what they were doing, but then it just like we said, it, it went over the top, 
And like you were saying about the quote about the fans being responsible for, um, you know, the death of rock and roll or whatever. I don't know, because I know who you're talking about. I don't know if I can say his name or not. <laughs> yeah, you can say but, we can play, but I'd rather not. I mean, it's rather just okay, keep it okay. between you and I. Cause, yeah, because I'm, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a fan, but I also know things like that that he says are like, really, you know, because honestly, if that were the case, the idea that rappers are now the new rock stars and that because, but his, what he's saying is because they're throwing money at the screen and they have girls and hot tubs and fast cars and all that. And like, I don't think that's a reason for people to switch musical genres immediately because you know that because guys are, are there with gold chains and throwing money at the screen i don't think that has anything to do with why people a certain genre of music is dying out and i don't really think because if that were the case all of those people who are fans of rock would all of a sudden switch over to rap and it it hasn't happened at least not in mass quantities <clears throat> I, I, yeah i don't know I don't think he thought that through. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you. so I have a record player and I have a lot of records <clears throat> and I have, um, you know, I, I'm a classic rock fan, right? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'll put, so I have four children and I'll put the white album on for my kids. Okay. Mm. And they all love it. Like They yeah. don't know it's the Beatles. Right. Okay. They don't know that it's the Rolling Stones miss you right yeah they don't know that they just know that this song sounds amazing actually yeah they don't know the cultural yeah uh, they're not they're not saying oh i like the rolling stones it's part of my identity as a rocker as a 40 year old white man from muxbridge i like rock and roll <laughs> they don't yeah, know yeah. they don't have that part of their identity they just know that when they listen to that music it's amazing and it when they put them yes, and you put on like yeah. I hate I don't mean to take a, to criticize a particular band, uh, but you know put on some music from a, uh, a a rock and roll band today, and it's not as good as that music is. Mm. I hate to say it, it's not even close. Yeah. And I wonder what it is. So I mean, the, it's I always joke that the Beatles wrote all the good songs already because <laughs> they, I, they I set think the blueprint. That's called the Pareto distribution. So there's actually okay. a scientific argument for that. And it, it holds uh, with the size of planets. It holds with the size of galaxies. It holds with the pay of NBA basketball players, soccer players, uh, songwriting, bands, everything. So if you get your slice of reality right, what you find is that 90% of the gains go to less than 10% of the people or 90% of the mass is held within less than 10% of the planets or it's, just, it's called a Pareto distribution. So it just okay. happens everywhere, right? So right. Um, less than 10% of all bands write 90% of all the good songs. It's just like, you know, I think there's a statistic, like if you didn't play with one of 16 basketball players, you never won an NBA championship. Right, oh, like okay. if you didn't play with Kobe yeah. Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, Michael Jordan, uh, you know, um, uh, whatever the guy for San Antonio's name was, not David Robinson, but the other tall dude, or and like uh, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, like if you didn't play with one of these guys, you never won a champion. It was impossible for you to win a championship, right? So like yeah. life is like that, and uh, so it happens. But what I'm what I'm interested from you is why does it? I, I, let me ask. Let me tell you this. I think there are movements in music. And then I think there are responses. Okay. So I think the glam rock right. era was a movement and the grunge rock era was a response mm -hmm. to the glam rock movement. It was like right. take, the pendulum swung all the way the other way. And yeah, as it usually does. Yeah. 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 And then now instead of like party time and having a good time and rock and roll all night and party every day, it was like, I'm going to commit suicide and my life shit. And <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the glam rock, I don't, yeah. I don't like grunge music. Like I liked it when I was sixteen. I don't like it yeah. anymore, man. It's really dark, actually. Yeah, it's it's funny. I have a better appreciation for it now than I did then because I was, um, uh, at the time, I was into the glam stuff, you know, and the mm. well, not just glam, but Guns and Roses stuff, where people were. Guns actually... and Roses is not a glam rock band. Oh, I agree. I agree. But I'm saying those they're bands they're their that, own thing. That... Guns and Roses <clears throat> is its own thing. But there are even bands like Motley Crue were glam for a Total period. Total glam, yeah. But they weren't always glam. You know, they really? didn't always. They switched out of it. I mean, but they all had an image. And music is show business, right? So sure. you could close your eyes and, and name off a, a pile of artists 
that from every genre and you know what they look like you know what i mean mm -hmm. you, you, sure. an image comes to your mind because even the ones that don't have an image that's their image you know you sure. know what bruce springsteen looks like you know sure. it's, it's all part of it um but no so i'm not i'm not throwing uh, guns and roses in the glam thing i'm just saying i was into all of that stuff sure. where aside from what they look like these were guys who could play their instruments you know they were good musicians and sure. when technically, Nirvana came mean. out technically you mean yeah technically yeah and so i was more into that type of songwriting the, the vocal range all that stuff and when nirvana came out i it was a, such a sonic assault like it was so different and it took me a while to go okay i get it like i was sort of like what is this it sounds horrible right <laughs> it's not it's like anti -music. guitars yeah and but you know, so did the Ramones. You know, and yeah, it, it was still like a, it's it like a negative and a positive. It's it, there's like a it's yeah. a it's a response to the glam rock era. The the chords are not as crisp. The uh, there's like a uh, the the um, there's no uh, glamorous guitar solos. The the people are kind right. of ugly. They dress poorly. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, seriously, yeah, yeah, that was it too? Yeah, yeah, and that's I mean, what I was thinking too. It was like, why wouldn't you take a shower? <laughs> like, yeah, for your video, like Kurt Cobain least, was you know. kind of gross. He looked like a street kid. Yeah, yeah. he looked like a street kid. The appeal now, yeah, but, yeah. Sure. But I could see the appeal because it was the, like you said, the opposite. Um, and now I also realize that a lot of those bands that got lumped in there, like Alice in Chains and stuff, were actually really good musicians. They were really good bands. Um, they were almost more like. Guns and Roses than they were like, mm. you know, grunge. Um, sure, yeah. And and so yeah, there there was more to it, but it as I don't know, I haven't used the word sucked in a long time okay. to talk about music. <laughs> and I no, but I, I think it's a really you know, when I hear something and I don't like it, I don't go, Ah, oh, this sucks. I go, Why don't I relate to that? Yeah, you know, sure. it's not that I don't I just don't feel it. And at the time, Nirvana, I didn't relate to it. That's all. Um, yeah. you know, it's like people will, will blame all kinds of bands for sucking now. And I go, no, I don't think they suck. They you just don't, it's not for you and that's okay. And now I can listen to Nirvana and, and respect what they did. But I also listen to, you know, Guthrie Govan or something, somebody who's like insanely talented. So I, I like all the spectrums because it's, it's music and there's value in all of it. I think, um, I think there's, I think, again, cause. I think a good way to look at it is that some music is kind of like an anti-music. Mm. It, it's, yeah. it's a it's way art. to look at It's more about art. No, but I, I think what you, and that, that doesn't mean bad. It's like positive and negative, right? So for, for example, right. I mean, whether you like Drake or you don't like Drake, or whether you like Kurt Cobain or you don't like Kurt Cobain, um, they're musical geniuses in a sense, and they're marketing geniuses. Right, so they they they, yeah. they created yeah. a a um mu they created music and they they dovetailed it with a lifestyle which resonated in the climate of their times, and that's what great artists do. Yeah, yeah. There, there's more to it than just being good on your instrument. There are lots of people on YouTube. Who are there's more great musicians now than ever. There's like we Absolutely, the world has yeah. more amazing musicians in 2020. There's no dearth of technical talent. There's a dearth of creativity. Yeah. That's what I yeah. think. Uh, and and people often talk about being original and I don't think again, you know, like you said about the Beatles and we were talking about them writing all the good songs. Um you know, we have 12 notes and when you think of the the amount of music that's been put out and is still put out every day with those 12 notes, it's, it's astounding. And it really is when people are, are doing, you know, having lawsuits over similarities and songs, it's like, geez, you know, you have to <laughs> almost be careful when you're writing something you think is totally original, but I think authenticity is more important, um, than originality because, you know, again, 12 notes, it's been done pretty much anything you can think of. Um, but I think if it's if it feels real and it's it's natural to you and it resonates with other people, then that's you know that's a win for sure. Yeah, and and it's true uh, on you know YouTube or Instagram or all these places you can find just amazing musicians, technically speaking. But where's the song? I see a lot of guitar players 
And honestly, I think this is why my instrumental CD is getting some sort of traction, why people mm. actually care. Um, it's not that I'm that great technically. I mean, there are probably, you know, 10 year olds on YouTube that can play better than me. It's not about that. It's that there are actual songs there that aren't about showing off the guitar or showing off anything like that. Is, are you playing that or am I playing that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing it. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> but when I hear that, um, it's again, it's not about being flashy, you know. It's, Do you it's know about Kirk Reed? Songs. Do you know Kirk Reed from the Reed Effect? You know him? He's a Toronto musician. No, it sounds familiar. So okay, he, it sounds he, familiar. Yeah. So he was in my studio the other day, and he came in the studio. We were chatting, and. Uh, what he said was, and what we determined was kind of part of the whole YouTube problem, is like when people are, are kind of um, flexing on the gram, like on Instagram or flexing on YouTube yeah. with their <laughs> skills, there's an egotistical narcissism to it, which is very repugnant. Mm. Artists, yeah. what artists are doing when they're good or when they're great is they're giving to the audience. They're not taking anything. And when people are kind of bragging about their skills and they're saying, look at me, how great I am. Most people don't want to look. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. When I see, uh, like there are, I don't know, countless guitar players, for example, who, um, and it's cool if you're into this, I'm I'm not dissing it, but you know, you could go on Instagram or, or, you know, YouTube and there are people just shredding and it's technically perfect. And, you know, over some kind of lush, sterile keypad and, and sterile is a word because it just, it's like I watch them because just listening to it, I, w- I don't really want to listen to that driving my car or something. Sure. Um, but I'll watch a bit of it and go, wow, that's cool. And then, okay, enough. I, I'm not going to. It's you know, a side keep, I, I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And, and again, I, it's not to diss the, the, the you skill. You ever seen a sideshow? taken. You ever seen a sideshow? Uh, like a legitimate yeah, sideshow? I, so. I, I think so. Like a freak show. <laughs> like a, a freak show. Or freak, a yeah, show. yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah so I, I was have, in yeah. I was in Austin a couple weeks ago, and I went to the Museum of the Weird, and there was a legitimate freak <laughs> show. Like the guy okay. had a growth disorder, which um, blended his two. He had three fingers. His these two fingers were combined together into one and long okay and these two were combined together into one and long and then his thumb and his feet were the same way and there's like this is a known disease and like one in a hundred thousand people have it or whatever right and he goes on stage and he does his freak show right and then everyone you know gives money in the pot and this is it's not this is very distasteful it's not allowed and i don't don't know if it's illegal but it's certainly our social mores have pushed it to the to the uh, far away but they used to have these all over the place right Right and, right, right. and like a freak show you watch, you don't like that you're watching it. Maybe it makes you feel a little bit sick to your stomach, but you can't take your eyes off it. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, the good music or a band that's really touching your soul doesn't feel like that. It goes in the other right. direction and it's drawing you in. Yeah, and so very good I, point. Yeah. I, I think that like the whole technically sterile YouTube thing is kind of like a freak show in a way. Like, what are you yeah. doing? You're you're bragging. All you're doing is showing how technically good you are on the guitar to the world. But are you giving us anything with that, Darren? Yeah, and and I that's it. I agree. I don't think there's anything. There's a little bit of value in in the entertainment, I suppose. But again, uh, even as a musician and a guitar player, I'll watch them and go. That's really cool. I can't do that, but I'm not going to, uh, I, I mean, if I could get a minute of entertainment watching it, it could be a 12 minute video and I'm just not going to sit through it because it's, I've seen it. I, I, in a minute, I saw everything that I need to see. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I can take, you know, bad out of hell and I can listen to that CD in, in my car for, I don't know how many times sure. I've heard it and still, it still feels like exciting to me. Sure. That's a power of good songs, good music, and like the Beatles, you know, you can listen to it again and it still feels, moves you, right? And, For sure. And, you know, like giving something, that's a good point. When I make videos, and I was talking to somebody about this the other day, about my, my music videos, I 
made I think at least four for the um, the album that that I've done, and I make them myself. There's no budget, and they're completely silly uh, and goofy. And the whole point of that, though, is to entertain because a lot of people. Uh, when they're making a music video on a you know a level like mine, where it's you know you're not a rock star or anything, and they make videos and they they hire a crew and they make it as polished as they can, and the whole point is to project some image. And to me, uh, it's not about me. I mean, it yeah, it's my music and it's my face and my guitar and everything. But really, um, if I want somebody to sit through a music video and listen to my song for three minutes, I want them to be entertained. Um, so trying to make something look way too polished doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, mm. and, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, and again, I'm not dissing anybody for that. It's just my take on it might be slightly different. Scott, um, while you're, while we're, li I want you to look up who's the guy that he's an Irish writer and he wrote the, the essay, the critic as artist. Can't remember his name. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm on it. Yeah, let me know who that is. So here's my point. I think uh, in the critic as artist, and I'm going to give the, the writer from the 1800s the credit in a second as soon as Scott tells me his name. But what he talks about is that actually the artist doesn't matter. It's, it's Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Okay. Uh, yeah. The critic as artist. Okay. And what he would say is that I don't care who the artist is and I don't care what the artist thinks of their music or their paintings or anything else. It doesn't matter. It doesn't right. matter what the artist thinks. And I, and I think the other, it, it's not, it doesn't, the art doesn't belong to him. Once you put it out there, it's yes. not yours anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Like a good way to think about it, I think for me, and I'm not a musician, um, a good way to think about it is that it doesn't belong to you. It's actually not your music and you're giving it to people. And it's kind of liberating in a way because once it's out there, it's, it's kind of like none of your business, you know, you put it out and you, you can move on to the next thing and hopefully people gain some value out of what you've and, created. And it keeps and, you out of that ego space, which is so gross. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's really tough. You know, as a musician, any any artist, we're told something pretty counterintuitive, I think. We're, we're always told, um, you know, you need a thick skin because people will criticize what you do. And, but meanwhile, we, unlike most other jobs, are, are, what we're creating is so vulnerable we're we're putting something out there that we're hmm. you know and and then we put it out and geez the first time i got a, a, a like a, a thumbs down on one of my videos i was like i don't what did i do like I, like why does this person hate me i what what are they what don't they like do they not like the song do they not like my shoes what it, you know you don't know what it is and and you can really drive yourself nuts with that so again it's liberating to put it out there and stop worrying about because now we, we on social media and it drives me crazy i really have a uh, an intolerance like a love hate thing with social media but you post something and then you're checking your likes you're checking really your okay feedback you're checking and people do that and it's it's such a waste of time <laughs> well yeah so here, here's what here's what i wrote down but it didn't like you you kind of moved on from the point yeah, sorry. when you were taught, no, no, that's okay. No, because I'm listening to you, right? I'm interviewing you. I'm writing stuff down when I'm reading, reading, interviewing you. And when you were talking back about technically someone's on the guitar and they're on YouTube or social media and they're showing you their technical side, it's almost like people are doing a mass audition for social media validation. Ah, very. That's very well uh, put. <laughs> it's sad, but I think that's exactly it. That's what it is. It's like uh, yeah. they're auditioning for social media validation, and it's kind of gross, actually. Yeah. And we all do it. Like yeah. I do it with my podcast. Um, so I do a lighting show. Yeah. It's it's pretty popular in the lighting community. And uh, like I I get a hit when people like the the, sh the fucking stupid shit that I do. And it's like <laughs> of course, I, yeah. it grosses me out that I like it actually. Yeah. I know. It's it's disturbing that you can't. Yeah, yeah. We you know all, what we I mean. Like I, I kind of yeah. like disgusted with myself for liking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why why do I? Have why do to I care? If somebody. Yeah. Yes, it's it's ego yeah. validation. That's why it's gross, Darren. Yeah, yeah. You know. But yeah, and what's the solution? Like, how do we stop doing it? Or just give, we? just give, you man. Know? Just give yeah. your art. Yeah. I mean, and not that you shouldn't get paid. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Like those no, are two but different give things. It without, yeah, yeah. Oh, we give it yeah. without like just like I'll be okay. Like if someone were to say, 
uh, that's our wedding song. Like whatever song it's ours actually we own it because it it means such as the summer we fell in love that was the song of the summer yeah. and we danced to it like so many times that you know over that summer and then we played it at our wedding and it's our song and if the artist yeah. comes along and says no it's not it's my song actually it's like <laughs> no it's not I, I it's can't ours. even imagine I, I can't imagine any any artist that wouldn't be you know, humbled and, and actually be so grateful for that kind of thing. I mean, for me, that would, that's the, that's the validation that I want, you know, mm. not just, uh, likes on Facebook, although I appreciate that. Of course. I don't think that's, that's validation. World. I think it's gratitude. No. I think it's gratitude. Sure. And that's, but that's the yeah. world we live in, right? If, sure. if people don't, um, share your stuff or like it on YouTube, I, I don't look at numbers overall though. Like I, uh, some people think, I think it's a mistake that a lot of, a band starting out make is they're so concerned with hustling on on Instagram and, and the, the, all they're doing is just duping people into liking their or following them. Sure. And those people aren't really engaged. They're not. They're there because they they're either guilted, they're tricked, or they're or they're paid for. It's a crude uh, metric. Yeah. Like social media don't... likes and followers. It's a crude metric. Yeah, I'd rather have five hundred people who actually care. Mm -hmm. than thousands and thousands that are indifferent i i mean what's the point I, i'd rather hey i'm everybody's welcome i'd love to have, yeah sure you know uh, lots of people but I, I those people should actually care is what i'm saying and i think a lot of bands or or artists are so concerned with what it looks like what their mm -hmm. numbers look like and i don't think that's yeah, but like uh, if if those numbers translate into dollars I understand mm. it. Like if they or people if they, showing up at their shows. Yes. And, like yeah, and I get they don't that. Ever. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah. like I I don't I you know I don't know how to a so I know how a lighting podcast should use LinkedIn to gain notoriety and followers and you know as a uh, as a public relations tool, okay? I I know yeah. how a lighting podcast should use LinkedIn, okay? That particular media I have no idea how a band would use Instagram as a publicity or public relations tool. Because that, well, that, that's right. what they're talking about. Like Instagram is public relations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a combination of publicity and public relations. But it's like we're putting this track out on, in, on Instagram and we're controlling it. And this is the video people are going to see. And they can swipe this way and then they see this and they swipe that way. And then what happens after that is publicity, likes, shares, whatever, right? So... I don't know how they would use it, but what I would say is that if they're just purely interested in how many people um, liked it or saw it, as opposed to whether that translated into dollars. So for me, if you're a professional musician and you want to and you want a career as a musician, if you're only concerned about the likes, then you're not actually wanting. You're interested in fame, and. Mm. And fame is a trap. It's like a you need that fame to translate into money, so that then you can actually build something with it. Does that make? Am I crazy here, Darren? Like if yeah, you're not no, focused on the dollars, man, you need to by if, <laughs> if you're putting out music and you're not getting any money for it. I, and I'm going to say something maybe controversial to you here, you there. It's worthless by definition. Right, right, because there has to be some something coming back and if exactly it's, people say they people sell it's, it's supposed to be a business treat it like a business but uh, you know i've i've watched a lot of um you know youtube videos and and listen to podcasts of, of sure. people who have the answers right and they, mm. they this is what they say they know the music business um and they they know social media and all these the, the gurus i guess and i've read books and, and everything just to try to get a handle but i i, I would not follow any of those people as to the letter, you have to take bits and pieces. Some of them are really good. There are some scammers out there too, of course. Sure. Um, so you have to use your own common sense and realize that there, the answers aren't always just, there is no clear path. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and so people say, well, treat it like a business and invest money. This is what they always tell you because they have a product to sell you that will <laughs> make you money. But um, it's it's tough to get people to to shell out money for music. I mean, music is pretty much free nowadays. So 
I mean, I hate to say it, but that's the reality of it. And uh, people go to a show uh, for the experience, not just to listen to the music. They can do that at home, you know, on a streaming platform for, for pretty much nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's not easy to get people to shell out cash. And if they want to buy a CD, it's kind of merch now. It's not really, they're, they're not just buying the CD to listen to the music. It's like a, a product. Like they, they could it's buy a souvenir. A it's a say, souvenir. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, for me as a, as a musician, when somebody buys my CD, it makes me feel better than if they bought a t-shirt because it's the music, you know, but really sure. what they do with it, <laughs> you know, uh, they may or may not even have a CD player nowadays. It's hard to say. I got, I got, yeah. I got a, a, a suspicion for you that I might throw at you. Okay. Okay. All right. I think what yeah. you said is, is true for all time. I What's think it's, that about? I think it's probably always been very, very hard for anybody to make any money in music. I don't mm-hmm. think there's ever yeah. been a time when it was yeah. like, hey, you play a guitar, here's 50 bucks. Like, I, I, yeah. I just, I, I think that the music, I think one of the ways that musicians can kind of look at themselves with a, a, um, and be light about it is that you're here to entertain people, entertain us. Like you're not, if you're seeing the musicians as the, you're like the jesters of the court. You're not (laughs) the Kings. No, no, play a song for me, boy. So I can have a laugh. I mean, I hate to say it, but there's like an element of that to it. And guess what? The Pareto distribution, uh, I think for all time, it's like, 90% 90% of all the money goes to less than 10% of all the musicians. And I actually yeah. think it's probably easier today than ever for somebody who's a, a fantastically creative, amazing musician to become famous. I actually think it's the opposite of what everybody thinks. I just think that not any people are not that creative. I think they've, they've mm-hmm. forgotten or, or they need to remember that music needs to have meaning to it. And if it doesn't have yeah. any meaning, it's just projecting egotistical narcissism on the world, and people aren't interested in paying for that. Yeah. Well, and I think some of the, the big artists, like the big like pop artists, for example, mm-hmm. and again, I'm not, not dissing anybody because I like some of that stuff, but it is, it's hard not to like because it's formulated, and you've heard it before, and it's, mm-hmm. it's like you said, it's not very creative because it's almost a science, and... Mm-hmm. Um, so know, what's the difference? And, what's the difference between Taylor Swift and Motley Crue? It's the same thing. It a is, corporation you know, came and along and said, "Grow your hair, get it big, act like a badass, wear a vest without a shirt, get a tattoo on yeah. your arm, you have a bassist that's a little crazy, one arm drummer, and whatever, and start making songs about how crazy you are." That's the that's the uh, the corporate philosophy of doing a band in 1982. All right now it's like yeah. okay so you're an instagram goddess you're going to sing about this and you're going to be pretty and you're going to be americana and then after your americana phase you're going to go dark and you're going to turn into like this is the yeah. there's like a path there's like a yeah. corporate path they there, can walk yeah. them down right yeah and, and now you're and not you now are, you're the I've anti good <laughs> now you're the anti good girl now you're the bad girl right or whatever and then so, it sounds like wrestling professional wrestling. it, it actually is yeah. like that's the corporate yeah, side of it scripted yeah but well, th- and those it's funny th- you say that. Yeah, go ahead. Because I, I, I always said that uh, when I hear Def Leppard and Shania Twain, it's very similar, and people would go, "What are you talking about?" But you think they had the same producer, you know? The, it's the same producer and the sound, and I mean, you could take the Go Go's, which I love. You know, uh, they're very good songwriters. Um, and that music is very similar to some of the rock bands of the eighties, like the harder rock bands. It's just song structure. Um, and you're right there, there's, there is a path that way, but that path is based on companies with sinking a lot of money into making sure that it can't fail. And that's the difference. Now we have people who are trying to get noticed on YouTube who have no money, no push, no you know, there's people like me who are bankrolling it themselves and hoping somebody sure. cares. Um, it's really hard to get people 
to just click play on a, a video if you post it on your you know on my facebook page uh, like my personal page not even my business page or my, my sure. music music page i have i don't know like three thousand friends or something and i mean people are so distracted and it's not their fault it's just what we're bombarded with all these memes and and trending things and if i post a video or a, a song i'm not sure th- like what the percentage but it's really low the amount of people that are actually going to click play okay. to listen to it um so there's what, and i don't blame anybody for that it's just it's how it is <laughs> well not only that though but i would say that i i would say that, that what you're pointing to is this is that there in the music world there's there's two there's two paths to success one you can actually be the musician and be a creative force in the world uh i.e prince kurt cobain um john lennon paul mccartney uh, the rolling stones and start a movement or start a a process of creative ambition which is virtually unstoppable um by society and so people are forced in, into hearing this music just because it's simply so good and it's viral i mean think about how easy it would be for a song to go viral now as opposed to 1965 right mm. or you can be a producer and what you can do is you can pick the pieces that you want to put together say backstreet boys boys to men taylor swift right <laughs> iron maiden i don't know and you can put those pieces together so the actual creative force of the band is not the people in the band they're just actors right mm. so you take backstreet boys they're just actors give me five pretty looking white boys or boys to men give me four handsome black guys that can sing and i'll put them into a band maybe those guys came up from this i'm not i don't know if i'm wrong about boys to men but they you can do it the model works right and then you well, give them yeah. some good, yeah, you give them some good songs and then you produce those songs for them and they get 3% of the revenue because that's what they deserve. Actually, they're just actors. The creative yeah. force is the producer or the yeah. guy that's putting the whole thing together. And then you hear about the back there to sell soft drinks or something, right? They're yeah. there to sell commercials. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Backstreet Boys sue their producer. It's like, oh yeah, they should sue. No, they're just actors, dude. They're just, they were yeah, hired yeah. to sing a song. They're a dime a dozen. And, uh, you know, they happened to got picked by this guy who was auditioning at the time. And now they're part of the Backstreet Boys. But this guy owns all the music. He wrote the music, produced the music, started the corporation that hired them as employees. You know, you understand what I'm yeah. saying here? So, so they just got famous and <laughs> yeah, they, they, they got the fame. That's what they wanted. And yes. They got Maybe they got a couple the million thing. bucks because they sung or whatever the deal is yeah. that they signed. But like when I hear about these lawsuits or whatever, it makes me laugh. And then the other thing, like you hear about like, oh, uh, uh, Led Zeppelin was sued by this guy for a whole lot of love. And, you know, George Harrison was sued by this guy. Guess, guess what, Darren? You would love to have that problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Like seriously. Like, well, there was a story. I don't know if you, you heard this story about um, uh, Huey Lewis. He he um he was approached by the Ghostbusters people and and they wanted to use one of his songs in the movie mm-hmm. and he you know back in the eighties there was this artistic integrity like no I'm not gonna sell out and let you use now you have to sure. use songs in movies it's the only way you get paid <laughs> but sure. he was like no no I'm not gonna let you use it so they went and got uh, uh, Ray Parker Jr I think it was and they they did a sound alike and they made a video and everything else and that song became a hit and but Huey Lewis sued them and he won. But the amount of money that he got from the lawsuit was actually less than if he would have just let them use the song in the first yeah, place. For sure. For and sure. so he, he so he was saying like he goes, That's a lesson for me in the future. Yeah, you Somebody know what he asked, just let them <laughs> Yeah, I mean let, let yeah. you don't own like a good way to look at it is that the music's not actually yours. And if somebody wants it, you mm-hmm. should probably default to getting paid and giving it to them. That doesn't yeah. mean you give up ownership of it. You. But yeah, let right. them pay right. you to take the music, man. Why not? Yeah, yeah I mean, why don't be Rob snobby? Zombie says, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rob Zombie's like they've been using the same song in movies for years, and they he goes, oh, I just keep getting money and buying big giant demon heads and stuff because yeah. they keep using the same. You know, it's like yeah, why not? Well, you know what just, I mean. Like the uh, guy that reminds me. Excuse me for a second. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I'm thinking. You know, blinding me. <laughs> you know what I was? I was thinking in my head here um, uh, about uh, you know that song that goes. I got a friend in Jesus and it's like about like it's yeah, kind of yeah. 
sarcastic uh, up in the sky or uh, spirit in the sky. Spirit in the sky. Yeah. Spirit in the okay? sky. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. like that song, like an anti. That's an anti song, right? So it's like a. But it's if great, you're in yeah. a scene with a helicopter, yeah, you have to play that song. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, but like that guy's probably. I'm sure he has no other hits. I'm sure that's his only song. He's probably like it's a it's like uh, some Christians actually sing it like legitimately, not knowing that it's oh, yeah. probably sarcastic to the bone. And I bet you the guy's right. Jewish or something, or he's like a Muslim or something. You know what I mean? Like uh. it's probably something ridiculous <laughs> like that to yeah. it that uh, makes it. Yeah, s- I think uh, Norman Greenbaum is Jewish. Yes, <laughs> there you go. You said I didn't even know that. Uh, so you know, it's so, like there's something I totally ironic about it, right? But in a sense, like is that. Did, you know, is his? Are you? Te- do you care technically if he's a good musician, or did that song resonate with people and did they take it and make it their own? And the people that are singing it because they're legitimate Christians and they like that the rock song talks about Jesus and they love it, mm-hmm. and then other people love it because it's not yours. It doesn't belong to you, actually. After you create, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Well, and, and like this CD, for example, has no um, no lyrics, so. Um, I, I don't have to defend that. Right. But a lot of my songs through this, the first time that's happened, most of, uh, I've been writing songs my whole life with vocals, with lyrics. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've often thought that when people ask me what something is about, I, I tend to not like to really get into too many details because it can take someone really out of it, you know? It can mean something totally different and why would i i don't want to ruin that for people if, if somebody really likes a song and i say oh it's about this and they go that's not what i thought at all and then i've just ruined it for them well i'll tell <laughs> you this like them... pablo picasso never talked about the meaning of his art yeah yeah well there you go yeah. i mean yeah. like he never told not anybody that, what not that, that i would mean. compare myself to <laughs> no but i mean what's yeah. the other salvador no, no. dali was another one he's the guy with all the yeah. crazy stuff he never told anyone, yeah, yeah, well, the pig means this. The crazy uh, dif- distorted pig in the corner, it means that. And that weird cross means this. No, he just let people decide what it meant to them. Yeah, I think it's what so great people have been died. talking about it ever since. Right? Yeah. They've, they've been trying to analyze it and what does it mean. Well, it's like Bohemian Rhapsody, right? People, oh, for sure. I, there, there are videos on YouTube, which I've wasted my life watching, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm never watching any more of these again, where people are, are really seriously trying to – uh, analyze what the words meant and what it what the song's about and everything and it's like you know <laughs> I think maybe we're better off not knowing you know like maybe the, maybe the this word just kind of rhymed with that word and it and it worked yeah it could <laughs> the whole thing could just be like this is a whole lot of fun to do and yeah that's Why great art it? though but, so John Keats you know John Keats the poet. Uh, I know the name. Yeah. Okay, so he's. Uh, uh, I studied English lit, so a lot of English. Okay. Lit. <laughs> and uh, in university, so he um, he is a romantic poet from like he died in like 1825 or something like that, and he wrote a letter to his friend on a subject, a very famous letter. It's studied all the time, and it's about negative capability. It's called negative capability, and what he means is not being negative, but the the ability of an artist to exist in an answer free place to be able to exist just in the mystery of the art. And so if the artist has negative capability, what he's doing, like uh, uh, what, like Shakespeare had tons of negative capability, John Keats said. So when he wrote King Lear, there's a million ways to interpret King Lear or, or, uh, or D- Julius Caesar or these works of art or by Salvador Dali. The great artists have this negative capability, this ability to produce a mystery for others to untangle. And that's what you're seeing with Bohemian Rhapsody. It's like people love, it's such wonderful art that people can't stop thinking about it and trying to think about what it means to them. And it it captures us naked apes. It captures us in a way, (laughs) you know, good art. And it it, it grabs our consciousness and makes us focus on it. It makes us spend time on it. And this idea that, um, you know, like we talked about the um, auditioning for social media validation is the opposite of negative capability. It's the opposite of it, right? Right. You know, and and that's that's it. It's it. Um, I think you're right. It it actually has that value um, when you can listen to it and and or look at it or read it, and you're going to be um, analyzing it for you know generations. Um, and you think, well, why? What's even the point? But that that is the point. People people care enough 
to still be, you know, listening to certain Beatles songs and wondering what they mean. Or well, how many times was John and... Lennon asked if Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is about LSD? He must have been asked that question 5,000 <laughs> times. I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and every time he answered, oh, you know what, uh, little Julian came up to me and he said, Dad, it's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And so I started to play, you know, and he yeah. has that <laughs> weird story about either Julian or one of his kids or McCartney's kids or whatever coming to him and saying, drawing a picture and it's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And there's this negative capability. There's no answers. There's only questions. Right. And ask yourself as yeah. many questions as you want about the art. Huh. Yeah, it's amazing, really. It's <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of a, a magical mystery uh, tour <laughs> moment when you, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. When you figure something like that can happen, um, you know, like the the, the single uh, that I have out right now, the the mm -hmm. you're at this B flat. Um, I, I was asked like, how did that song come about? And it's hilarious because my yeah, that, that's the one. So. This riff, that riff that's behind there, yeah. <clears throat> it came about because my cat, I have a sphinx cat, likes to get up and sit on me all the time. And I, when I have my guitar and I'm just noodling around, she likes to get up and actually bite the strings, like to get me to stop or whatever, but she bites the strings. So I made that riff up when I was sitting on the couch and I was kind of playing a teasing riff to her. And I went, that's kind of neat. So I like recorded on my phone, just that little riff. And then it turns into this song. And so that's probably more information than I should give people. <laughs> but it is kind of a funny story of how... It's a funny story. <clears throat> yeah, it was just, uh, it was created because of something silly uh, on the moment. And and if I hadn't had my, the technology, that's another interesting thing, is now my phone is full of like voice memo, little things of me just oh that's cool and i jam something out um if i didn't have that technology that moment would have been gone it would have been just something that happened in the moment and i would have forgot and probably thousands of those happen all the time um but you know what i think the technology in one way facilitates the art and i think the uh, in the other sense it kind of reduces it or it makes it harder i mean take like beethoven or bach Okay. The most complicated. Okay. I'm just going to say I'm not, I'm not a big uh, classical music fan, but I, I love listening to people play classical music on the piano. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to orchestras in Austria and I kind of get turned off by the snobby having to know the when to clap, when not to clap and all this kind of crap. Mm -hmm. So I was in Austria and I went to and I clapped at the wrong time. and Everyone looked at me like I was some kind of pariah that didn't know how it worked. <laughs> oh, no. It's like, no wonder <laughs> your genre is dying, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no wonder nobody yeah. wants to come here because they don't know when yeah. to get ex They can't feel excited unless they know all the rules, right? And so yeah, but yeah. I but we have to acknowledge that that's the greatest maybe music ever made because it's it's True enduring enough, yeah. simply because of its enduring and in cross culture so Chinese people love these German composers and uh yeah. and yeah. Americans and people of all languages love it so that's maybe the greatest music ever made think about it they never had any of these recorded they never recorded anything no no they weren't selling uh selling cds out of their car Every, everything vinyl. was live you know it was yeah that was your music you you had to go to see it and or hear it and yeah it was an experience yeah so i mean yeah. I, and um, like the, if that's the greatest ever i mean maybe the music should come from your soul in a sense maybe yeah. it and they're writing writing it down and yeah and composing it like yeah um multi-instrument yeah, multi-instrument like oh yeah yeah you had to know all of it um and and really for me i think um i don't know how to explain this i think that there's some value in the technology so it, it, for the sake of efficiency i mean my album i don't know how i would have fit it in because nowadays we're we're so busy you know we, you have to work multiple jobs and you know have a business and you have oh, you know just always something going on um and so because I had the technology to make it efficient, I could work from home. I could work in the middle of the night. I could do whatever I, I want if I, you know. But that maybe that's the problem. It makes it a lot easier. But it's also it the problem be, in a way. 
it's you're right it it's both um and i think it can be used for good and for evil <laughs> you know um but i mean at the same time the gatekeepers become the fans really i mean yes. in other words we don't have to if we don't love it we don't have to buy it we don't have to support it um but we can also access anything so but yeah i guess there anybody can make music from their, their macbook anywhere and you know they don't even have to play an instrument so i don't know i, I don't know what to <laughs> okay so so i'm an entrepreneur okay and i think one of the problems with most musicians is that they're not entrepreneurs okay mm. and if they're trying yeah. to have a career in music what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a music business. That's what you're trying to do. Right. Right. So yeah, if you want to earn a living, whether it's as a sole proprietor, you know, playing at bars, maybe you get it 500 bucks a night to play at a bars, or maybe because you're so good and you bring kind of draw a crowd and people know you in that town, yeah. or whether you're trying to be a person that produces albums or, or singles or whatever, you need to think of it like a business. And a lot of musicians that I talk to and I tell this to, they kind of snoot their nose at me and get pissed off. But uh, if your music is not selling, it's because nobody wants to buy it. And that's your problem, yeah. not theirs. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't blame the, the music fans for yeah, not it, it ain't your pro It ain't their problem. It. No, no. Exactly. It's actually no, I, your I problem. Not, not you, yeah. not Darren, but like it's the no, artist's no, problem. Right. Like yeah. if people don't want to buy your art, that's your problem, man. Yeah. Nobody yeah. owes you shit, and... actually. This, you know, this is what I've been saying, uh, and it took me. I went through a period of time where um, I was. I, I realized that my attitude was probably my biggest problem, and mm. fortunately, I realized it. I was. I mean, I wasn't really bad, but I was kind of like. I, I think I was frustrated, like most mm -hmm. musicians, and I see it all the time. Same as I was saying about people over hustling on on social media. Um, we, we we're calling our, that auditioning. We're calling that ad auditioning yes. for social media validation. That's what we're calling that. Yeah, yeah, and and I need to write that down. And remember, but yeah, there's there are people are focusing on the wrong things, and um, they so they'll post a video on social media, for example, and they get very little interaction or, or response, and they get pissed off. And I I get it. I understand the frustration. But the world doesn't owe you anything. And again, as frustrating as it can be, it can be liberating too, because we often, as musicians or artists, we're, we're, we're afraid to put things out. So we call it perfectionism, right? We, we have mm. to make sure it's perfect. And, you know, you, you need to forget perfection and focus on being done. And what I do with my album is I, I set a deadline and I worked on it as, you know, I had to be self-discipline and, and, uh, treat it like a business. I have my own business and I understand how that kind of thing works. Um, and so when, when it goes out there, this is where it's liberating is that, you know, people might not like it. People might ignore it, but it's done. And like you said before, now it belongs to them. So you move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to still keep working it. Still, I have to, and that's where, um, I think another problem is where people's focus is. They put a CD or um, a single or whatever they put out, they put a product out and they forget it's a product and they don't, it's like putting it out on the shelves and leaving it there. You, you have to do something to get people interested. So you're speaking, I mean, we humans are so funny. Okay. So like you're talking about, <laughs> you see an artist, he puts something out on YouTube and he doesn't get any likes and he gets mad about it. Okay. So that is so obviously somebody in their ego. And when I'm going to say that, what I say by that is like this, Darren, think of it this way. Let's say that guy wasn't him. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the very same person, okay, who is upset that people don't like his music, if he wasn't himself and he could see himself, wouldn't he think he was ridiculous? <laughs> yes. I, that's, that's why yeah. I don't... 
do that anymore. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's like we humans, it's like you, we do things and it makes so much sense to us. As And when we're in mm. ourselves, it's like, how dare people not like my music? My mom always told me I was a good boy when I played my guitar. And nobody's telling yeah. me now that I'm a good boy and I spent so much time. The world owes me this and they should give yeah. me this validation on social media and money too and everything else. And it's like, nobody cares, dude. You're not, you have to give, yeah. you have to give without remembering. Yeah. You know, you and have that, to give. That's it. I, it's, it's frustrating if you really think about it. But again, it's being in the ego, right? When you think, yeah. man, I, I, I put weeks and months and all this effort into recording this song and I, I worked really hard and I bared my soul and I put it out there and nobody cares. And so that can be frustrating. Um, but you also have to, just step away from it and remember nobody owes you anything. They don't have to buy it. They don't have to like it. They don't have to even, you know, I think a like better it on way, social media. I think a better way to put it out <laughs> is one, you kind of abandon your work in a way. You don't finish yeah. it. You just stop working on it. Yeah, it's done. <laughs> like you abandon it. Yeah, like you could keep going. You say it's done. Yeah, yeah. yeah you could keep going yeah. probably, but you just kind of abandon it. Yeah. The reality is, is that's how artists should think about it. Once you're done, yeah. it's not yours anymore. Yeah. Put it out yeah. there. And it's, a, and it's a and it's a time stamp. That's why I'm a fan of the album. Like when I think about it, hey, a CD. Who cares, right? Like we said, it's mm -hmm. it's merch. Why would I even make a CD? Um, but you know what? I've actually been selling CDs, so somebody cares. Mm. But to me, I like it because I have a collection of CDs. I like owning something, and I'm like, well, if I'm going to put this out, I want my own. CD in the in my collection, sure. and um, but the reason I like the album as a fan of music is that I like the fact that it is a time period that all the songs are in the order that they're supposed to be heard and all that, and you can listen to it and you go, ah, this is great, and even if you don't want to hear them in the, after you know you've heard it a few times, I don't like that song, I'm skipping it. You can make your own digital playlist if you want, but I like the fact that it is a just a time piece and then the next album you know after appetite for destruction is out the next album comes out and you can't wait to hear what's going to happen next right and, so here i'll tell um, you a quick story bought a record player my wife went on craigslist or whatever kijiji and this guy was selling all of his records for like 200 bucks and he was moving he needed to sell it right away and it had like bob dylan led zeppelin the beatles all kinds of rolling stones records everywhere, wow. right? okay oh, so i never liked led zeppelin okay I never mm. didn't didn't like them. I just thought I don't get this Led Zeppelin. Like, what you sound like stuff? me. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm with you on this one. I know. Where, I I, 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 know where I you're never going. Go I never got it. <laughs> but I put on Led Zeppelin two on the record player one day. Okay, and I listened to the whole A side and then the whole B side. Couldn't skip. Couldn't say, "Oh, this song stinks." I want the next song. I had to listen to the whole thing. And I was like, "Yeah, that makes a lot more sense to me now." Actually, yeah. You know what I mean when you listen Amazing. to the album. Say, yeah. And I think I think yeah. you should press vinyl, man, because yeah. uh, I think you should go beyond CDs. And there's a there's a vinyl shop right behind us here on, in in Toronto that presses vinyl to the, right now. And I think you yeah, should. Yeah. I I think if you you know I think that there's something to listen like the, a record player forces you to listen to an album. Yeah, you can kind of switch to the next song if you like know where it is and drop the needle in the right spot, but it's kind of annoying. Sure, yeah. You know, because yeah. you don't want to do that anyway. You ah, just want to let it play. And, yeah. 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 Well, I thought about, you know, the thing about vinyl to me is um, you almost have to, because it's pretty expensive. It's expensive to make and it's expensive to sell. Um, and I feel like uh, for somebody who nobody knows who I am yet, I mean, like I'm still building this, mm. this up that, um, it would be hard to sell it. People want to buy vinyl from a band that they they are a fan of, mm. or I think that's about to classic. change. I think that's about. I to think change. eventually. I think I think it's going to because people are looking for new vinyl, like that they have. Yeah, they are, for, like they did in the old days. So I yeah. think it will change. Um, but I was kind of hesitant at first. I'm like, yeah, I'm sinking my money into just getting, sure. you know, the CDs, getting everything done, and <clears throat> but who knows? You know, there's always it. It, the good thing with the technology now is it, it's not over. You know, if I want to um, do a run of vinyl, you know, for everything I produce in three years from now, I can still do it, you know. And hopefully by then there will be a lot of people who actually 
want to buy it. <laughs> so nice. at, at the yeah, at the risk of offending everything we've talked about in the last hour, because we spoke it for an hour, uh, Darren. <laughs> um, what are you trying to say with an album without lyrics? That's a good question. I I think you know we're almost going back to what we just said about interpreting. Mm. Yeah. And I don't necessarily want to interpret it for somebody. Um, from what a, is it about a, for you then? What is it about for you? Yeah, and and I don't. Is think that a better uh, question? Is that a better better question? Maybe what is it about? Maybe for you? maybe, and I don't, and I don't think that that what it's about for me is self indulgent because I made it right. So obviously sure, exactly. it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> when I was doing this, like I said, I had a car accident. It was just giving me something, and the reason I called it lifting the curse was it actually felt like that every every step of the way it seemed like i was healing and feeling better and having something to be excited about and i had other things going on too but i worked you know all summer last summer I, every i don't want to say every day or every night but i mean it was very it was always in my mind you know i can't wait to get to the next part i'm going to work on drums for something or writing a song whatever it was just it was an ongoing process and so i mean just even even when i think of like the the titles and stuff there there is there is something um something there that sort of connects with nature to me i spent a lot of time just out hiking and just getting outside and and uh i know that probably sounds weird for something that's you know recorded on a computer but <laughs> sure. that that was try sort of my connection was was just uh so you know, and, and you watch the videos and there's always animals in them and you know or, or mostly so lifting the curse then from what you're saying has without any validation or sales has intrinsic therapeutic value for you absolutely yeah if, if nobody bought it and nobody wanted to interview me and nobody listened to it um i'd still be proud of it i'd still be happy that i got it done or and maybe it's just like a I journey. Said, I, I, maybe it's just the record of yeah. your journey to, to to restore your body and your mind. True, true. Yeah. And if people uh, like it, they like I, it. If somebody finds yeah, inspiration in it, great. Yeah, absolutely. And if I didn't listen to it ever again, I would have enjoyed and got some value out of the journey of recording it and creating it. Um, but it is nice to have the, the finished product for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, what what you're saying to the world is, I'm moving on from my car accident. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'm not sure. Um, to be honest, when it when I was recording this, that was my feeling. I was going through that um, because it was in the past. It was, I was putting it behind me, and I wasn't really thinking I would ever even talk about it again, at least you know publicly, because I didn't. I I never mentioned the car accident on social media you know, only a few people really knew what I was going through. And, uh, and when the press release came out and there was talk about this, and this is very recently in the past few months, I've had people go, I didn't even know you were in a car accident. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, well, it was sort of like, this was my private, um, therapy. So now that it's out there, um, like I said, I don't get into a whole lot of details, but I'm always happy if it can help people who, because this happens every day, people are always in, car accidents and even if it's a fender bender it still can, can have some uh serious aftermath so um so this was something that helped me anyway and hopefully maybe it can help people through their own you know music heals you never know what it's helping people with so um that that would be ideal yeah Darren michael boyd i think that's a good place to call it man I really appreciate awesome. you coming on the Get a Grip on Life podcast. Throw your social media and all that sort of stuff out there for anyone listening now. Okay, so you can find me. I'd say the best thing is uh, DarrenBoyd.com, my website, because you can find everywhere that I am will be linked from there. Um, okay. And if you look Darren Michael Boyd up, you Google me, you'll find me. <laughs> so that's D-A-R-R-E-N-B-O-Y-D.com? Dot com, yep. All that's right. it. And folks, listening to this, hey, whew, we made it. If you made it this far with Darren and Michael, good for you. Um, if you're mowing the lawn, you're driving your car, whatever you're doing out there, do you want to start a podcast? Come on, man, or girl, or whatever you happen to be. 
Maybe you do. Most people that listen to podcasts actually in the back of their mind think to themselves, you know what? I think I have what it takes. That Culligan, he's nothing. I could beat that Joe Rogan. No chance. I could take him down. So try it out. But you don't want to wait. You can't download an app on your phone and the next day you have the Joe Rogan experience. It doesn't work like that. There's actually a lot of work to creating a quality podcast in 2020. Yeah, in the old days, you could put a microphone on the table and fart into it and people would laugh and some people would download it and you put it up on the internet. Now you got to have high quality stuff. And it's hard to find guests and it's hard to get people to do it. And that's why you need Get a Grip Studios, baby. That's getagripstudios.com. Hey, we're not cheap. It's not cheap. But if you were to say save up a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks, you could probably put out five or 10 episodes and then see what happens. And uh, that's the way to do it, man. So uh, worrying about you know, production, putting it up on a, on a podcast network, managing your YouTube channel, getting it all set up and uh, creating a website and doing all this other stuff, that's going to drag you down. That's why most podcasts were a bucket list and are now on everybody's bucket list. And the reason why is because, the reason why is because of not recording the podcast. The reason why is because of all the 90% of the work is not recording. 90% is the other stuff that Scott Walker is a really badass at doing, and he's sitting right there right now. Hey, Scotty, what's happening? It's good morning. Yeah, there you go. So get him to do all the work for you, and you just record and find guests. So go to getagripstudios.com. And, of course, thanks to my guest, Darren Michael Boyd, you got to go to D-A-R-R-E-N-B-O-Y-D.com to check out his new album, Lifting the Curse. We thank you. Michael, thanks for coming on the show, man. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Bye for now, man. Bye all the guests out there. Talk Bye. to you.